everybody. So you are learning here about VLSI design and CAD here, digital CAD here. In this class, I am going to discuss about VLSI physical design automation. Okay. Um, in the physical design part, there are also many subsections, among which in this class I am going to discuss the floor planning and placement. Okay. In the I think in the previous class, uh, partitioning has been taught to you. Okay. So first, I am going to give you a brief overview of the VLSI design cycle. Okay. In the VLSI design cycle, first comes the system specification. Now, what is system specification? In this section, the specification of the total circuit or the total system is captured here. Okay. Suppose in the final output of the circuit, you want a voltage of 3 volts, output voltage of around 3 volts and output current of around 300 milliamps. These things are captured in this system specification. Next comes the architectural design. Now, what is architectural design? After you get a system specification, you now try to develop a basic architecture of this system. Okay. What are the blocks will be present there? A brief overview of that. How the box blocks will be connected to one another? All these things comes under this architectural design. Next comes the functional design. Now, what is functional design? Now, this blocks the output of these blocks gives some functions, output functions. Suppose say uh, you may require a function like y is equal to a b plus c d plus d a, something like that. This functional descriptions of the output of these blocks are given in the functional design stage. This functional design stage is also known as the behavioral design stage. That is the behavioral modeling of this the system is done in this part. After the functional design is complete, you now move on to the logic design part. Now, what is logic design part? In the previous stage, you have the functions. You know what are the functions you need to get at the output. Okay. Now, these functions you now map in with the gates. Okay. This is called the gate level design. You have many gates, AND gate, NOR gate, uh, XOR gate, etc., etc. You try to map these functions with the help of these gates. After you have completed the logic design, then comes the circuit design. You know that uh, gates are uh, uh, gates contain a uh, number of transistors. Okay. Now, how we will pl place these transistors in the circuit? This uh, transistor level design comes under this circuit design part. Okay. Now you have completed the design up till this transistor level. Now, what you are going to do now? The next stage is now you are going to implement this design in the silicon chip. Okay. For that, this part comes under the physical design. Okay. This physical design we are going to discuss here and this stage contains a number of different stages like partitioning, floor planning, placement, routing, etc. Okay. After the physical design is complete, next comes the fabrication. What is fabrication? Now you have completed uh, designing the chip. Okay. Now you are going to fabricate this one. After this fa fabrication, fabricate this one on the silicon chip. Okay. After you have completed this fabrication, then packaging comes, testing, debugging. If there is any fault or anything, you test those uh, chips and finally sell it into the market. Okay. Now what is physical design? physical design process. Okay, The process of converting the specification of an electrical circuit called netlist into a geometrical representation called layout. Now you are given a circuit netlist. Now you have to implement this circuit netlist into on a silicon chip. For that you need its orientations, pin locations, the shape of different blocks. You need all these things. The geometrical representation of this circuits how you will find those things. This problem is called the physical design problem. So what physical design automation deals with the research and development of algorithms and data structures related to physical design process. Okay. Now next comes the physical design cycle. 
there are number of stages, stages as earlier I have said that there is partitioning, there is flow planning, there is placement, routing, compaction, okay. Routing this thing will be taught to you in the next class. Now here I want to give you a brief overview of the design styles used in VLSI, okay. One is the full custom design, the second one is the standard cell, the third one is the gate array and the fourth one is the FPGA that is field programming gate, gate array. What is full custom design style? In the full custom design style, the designers can design up to the transistor level, okay. Designers can specify the how the interconnections between the trans each transistors will be how will be the layout of its transistors on the silicon chips, everything the designers can specify, okay. So, the designers is free to design the full chip on its own, okay, along its wish he can design those things, okay. Next comes the standard cell design style. In the standard cell design style, the designer is somewhat restricted in designing the chip. Why? Here you are given a library of cells. This library of cell contains some defined cells, okay. You have to while designing in this standard cell design style, you have to use only this defined cells present in the library. Other than this, you can't use any type of cells, okay. Suppose you need to uh, realize a function called y is equal to a, b, c plus d, e, f like this one, okay. So what you are going to do? You will think that I am going to design this with a 3 input and get a, b, c with 3 input and get. But suppose your library contains only 2 input gates. So here you are restricted. You, uh, here you can't in, uh, include 3 input NAND gates, 3 input gates here, okay. So you have to realize the function with those 2 input gates present in the library. So in this way, the designers are somewhat restricted in this standard cell design style. Next comes the gate array design style. What is done here? Here the transistor array that is the gates are prefabricated, okay. The designer needs the wiring customization to implement the logic. See you can find here the gates are present, the gates are already prefabricated on the chip. What the designer does, he connects this interconnection between the gates to get the final output. You want to implement this logic, okay. You need to connect the two XOR gate. Then with the two XOR gate, you need to connect with a NOR gate, then with the AND gate. Here the designer customizes the wiring, okay. Next comes the FPGA design style. Here both the logic and the interconnects are both prefabricated. See, you want to implement this circuit, this logic function. This part is already done prefabricated here. This logic we, along with its in interconnects are already pre prefabricated here. What the user does, the designer just routes this track to get the final output. Now there is a comparison table between the different types of design style, okay. And there are various parameters. The sale size, you know cell size for full custom design, it can be variable. You can implement a logic with 3 input NAND gate or 2 input NAND gate along your wish, okay. Along to, as, um, as you wish, you can design those things. But standard cells, there's the, you have to use those specific cells of the library. So its cell size is fixed. And in generally in standard cell, the cell sizes has fixed height. They are built in such a way, okay. In gate array, this is also fixed. In FPG, it is also fixed. Cell type, again, it is variable for, for full custom standard cell. It is also variable. Gate array, it is fixed because those are already prefabricated. And in FPG, they are programmable. In this way, you can see different parameters: cell placement, interconnection, fabrication layers, area. Area is one of the important thing. Area is compact for full custom design. 
but it is compact to moderate for standard cell gate array for it is moderate and FPGA area is large. So we can say that full custom design has the is based if we consider uh, the parameter area ok. Now comes the performance how the cells perform the performance of full custom design is high ok. Standard cell is high to moderate gate array is moderate FPGA low design cost full custom is obviously it will be high because you are designing the full system ok. Design cost for standard cell it is medium because you are using some of the cells of the library which are already designed earlier. Gate area also medium and for FPGA it is low and time to market obviously full custom design will be long because you have to design the full circuit and standard cell is medium, gate array medium, FPGA is low. Now let us discuss what is floor planning. Now the problem definition for floor planning. What is the input to the floor planning problem? Here you need a set of blocks. The blocks can be both fixed and flexible. What do you mean by flexible blocks? Flexible block is such a blocks which has a fixed area but its shape is not yet defined. Okay. You can have different shapes of a given area you can have different shapes. These blocks both fixed and flexible blocks are taken for floor planning problem. The pin locations of fixed blocks is also taken and the netlist. What is netlist? Netlist is actually the description of the interconnection between the different blocks. Okay. The requirements you have to locate, you have to find the locations for each block so that the main thing is that so that no blocks overlap. Okay. You have to avoid overlapping of each blocks. The next thing is that you have to define shapes of this flexible blocks. And what is your objective? Your objective is to minimize area and to reduce the net length, the interconnections between those two blocks that nets. You have to reduce those nets, length of those nets as much as possible. Okay, now comes the floor planning and placement. What is the difference between floor planning and placement? Is there any difference? Some may say that there is no difference here. Okay. The, in some cases, in some design styles, these two problems are almost similar in nature. But there is a major difference between these two. What is that difference? In floor planning, we consider both fixed and flexible blocks. Okay? And the exact location of this, uh, exact pin locations of this flexible blocks is not known to you. But in placement, all the blocks you consider are fixed they have well defined geometrical shapes. So their pin locations are also defined. Okay. So uh, we can say that floor planning problem is much difficult. It is much more difficult compared to the placement problem. This is because you can have a number of feasible shapes of the flexible blocks. Okay. But in case of some design styles, this floor planning and placement problems are same. Suppose for uh, standard cell design style, okay, there you are using some defined cells of the library. Their shapes are already defined. So in that case, this floor planning and placement problem is same. Now, let us uh, discuss one example. Let us have five blocks A, B, C, D. Their width 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, and their height is 1, 3, 1, 2, 1. Say this one. Now, this rigid blocks, the shapes are given. Now, some feasible floor plans. You can have a number of floor plans out of this one. Okay. See, E has a width of 2 and height of 1. Okay. This, uh, in this diagram, 
say we are placing E. Below it we can place A and B because both has one one and uh, sorry uh, this one is C. Height of uh, C is also one one. Height and width of C is one one and A is one one. Then below that we can place D. Okay. Then we can place B here. Sorry, I I think I have made one mistake here. D one, this height is one. Okay, that's fine. Now, next another possible way is that what E place D here, then place A and C, then place B. Okay. Next, another possible way. Place B here. A and C. In this way, you can have a number of feasible floor plans with given width and height. Okay. Now, for floor planning, what is a term comes slicing structure? Now, what is the slicing structure? The definition of it: a rectangular dissection that can be obtained by repeatedly splitting rectangles by horizontal and vertical lines into smaller rectangles. Suppose you are given a larger rectangular block. You are splitting these rectangular blocks with some vertical and horizontal lines okay to get some smaller rectangular blocks this is called the slicing structure now what is slicing tree this is a binary tree that models the slicing structure okay now the node of each node of this tree represents a vertical cut v or a horizontal cut h a third kind of node called wheel appears for non sliceable floor plans not for sliceable floor plans i will come with an example later and each leaf of this tree is a basic block okay now let us take this example have this sort of rectangular block okay now first what you are going to do you are going to cut this block with a vertical line okay this vertical line going to cut this block with a vertical line okay so you are going to get this as first leaf this as the second leaf now the what the slicing structure comes out to be the slicing structure i have said earlier that this uh, each node represents each node of the sli binary slicing tree is a vertical cut line or a horizontal cut line so this node comes out to be v it has two leaves the this is the first leaf containing a b c d e and this is the second leaf say containing h i f g f g okay now this first leaf is again cut with an horizontal line okay you are cutting this with an horizontal line then you get two other leaves two and three okay two and three now 
if you cut this second the number 2 leaf with a vertical line you are going to get one as a and the other this part this part okay now again dissecting it with a horizontal line you are going to get b and c okay now take this this part you need to first cut this one with an horizontal line okay then the node becomes h then the two leaves what it comes out to be uh, this is uh, say this one is a and this one is b this is a this is b cut this with an horizontal line okay sorry this with a vertical line you are going to get h and i cut this with a vertical line you are going to get f and g similarly this third part this one if you cut this with a vertical line you are going to get d and e so this structure this structure is called the slicing tree now a question comes in mind whether this slicing tree is unique or not the answer is no it can't be unique okay suppose you are given this rectangular block and this two can be the two possible solution for the slicing tree here you can find this vertical node is same after that in this part you are taking a horizontal line to get a b in this part you are also taking the horizontal line to get a b but in this section you are taking a horizontal line at this part so you are getting g as one node separately and this as the other part but what you are doing is that here you are taking here also a horizontal line but along this section so you you are getting cd as one part efg as the other part then successive vertical and horizontal line gives you cd ef and g so the slicing structure is not unique in nature now what is non slicing floor plan suppose this sort of block diagram is given to you this sort of rectangle is given to you can you cut this with horizontal and vertical lines the answer is no you can't cut this with horizontal and vertical lines so this type of structure is called non sliceable floor plan another name of it is wheel okay what you do is in general the notation of it is write a w then the nodes as a b c d e okay now comes the hierarchical floor plan what is hierarchical floor plan a floor plan is said to be hierarchical of order k if it can be obtained by recursively partitioning a rectangle into at most k parts okay at most k parts suppose this diagram is given here now seeing this diagram you will find that you cannot cut this diagram with any horizontal and vertical lines so there must be a wheel here non sliceable floor plan here also now you have to identify the wheel the nodes of the wheel like here a b c d e you have to identify this part now suppose i take e the center central position as 2 the block number 2 okay then what it will be 3 6 as one part suppose a a comes out to be 3 6 this total as another node this 19 as one node 5 4 as the other one and 2 the last one okay now 3 and 6 you can cut this with a vertical line to get 3 and 6 separately but you will find this structure this a b c d is given here just to you can make compare with this structure only okay so it is given here now 1 7 12 11 and 8 this is again a wheel structure okay so no horizontal or vertical lines can be drawn here 
So, this is a wheel structure with the nodes 1, 11, 8, 7, 12. Next comes the 5, 4 with a horizontal line you are getting 5, 4 separate little and 9, 10 again with a sorry vertical line both 5 and 4 vertical line and 9, 10 vertical line you are getting 9, 10 separated. Okay. In this way hierarchically you go on uh, you go on partitioning this uh, rectangular block with horizontal and vertical lines. Now floor planning algorithms. There are a number of floor planning algorithms. Now let us discuss about rectangular dual graph approach. There, there is also hierarchical approach, simulated annealing method. Okay. Now let us consider rectangular dual graph approach. The basic outline of this is that you are partitioning a rectangular block. Okay. On the process of partitioning, what you are generating? You are generating a group of sub circuits and their interconnections. Fine. Now, this output of this partitioning graph is output of this partitioning algorithm is represented by a graph. Okay. And the floor plans that can be obtained by converting these graphs into its rectangular dual in this thing is this is the almost the basic outline of this rectangular dual graph. Okay. Now, the rectangular dual graph satisfies some following properties. Okay. What are the properties? Each vertex corresponds to a distinct rectangle. Okay. The vertex of each graph corresponds to a definite rectangle. And for every edge, the corresponding rectangles are adjacent. How you can see? Suppose you are given a block 1, 3, 4, 2, 5. What is its dual graph? You are taking the C. The properties of it is each vertex corresponds to a def distinct rectangle. Okay. So, 1 will be 1 vertex, fine, 2 will be the other vertex, 3 will be the other vertex, 4, 1 vertex, 5 as the other vertex. Okay. All these vertex corresponds to a definite rectangle. Now what will be the edges? The edges between these two vertex, you will draw only at that time the edges when those two blocks are adjacent. Okay, see you uh, this 1 and 3 block is adjacent. So, you will draw an edge between 1 and 3. 1 and 2 is adjacent. So, there must be an edge between 1 and 2. 1 and 4 is adjacent. 2 and 5 is adjacent. Okay, 2 and 4 is adjacent. 3 and 4 is adjacent. And 4 and 5 is adjacent. But you will not find an edge between 1 and 5 because 1 and 5 block is not adjacent. Okay, this type of graph, if we consider that there is no cross uh, junctions between these blocks, then the graph, this dual graph which we obtain is called the planar triangular graph. This planar triangular graph satisfies different properties. One property is that you will find the faces of each part is a rectangle, is a triangle, okay, excepting the external part. The internal faces are all triangle. Okay. Now, uh, from this planar triangular graph, every this every dual graph corresponds to a rectangular floor plan. If you consider that there is no cross junction, okay. But every planar triangular graph does not correspond to a rectangular floor plan. Why this is because if there is a cross junction. So, suppose in this this part, there is there you will land up with a complex triangle. Okay, this curve for com complex triangle we cannot form any rectangular floor plan. So there are some drawbacks in this algorithm. One is that in this approach, some some sub problems are not yet solved. What is the sub, sub problem? The mainly the presence of this complex triangle. The presence of this complex triangle 
does not fully uh, we are not at all satisfied with this because this problem still remains here now the next approach comes is the hierarchical approach what is done here it is uh, mainly based on the divide and conquer paradigm okay at each level of hierarchy you deal with a small number of rectangles okay now suppose you are given here you can see here a small circuit is given abc and its possible floor plans given here okay from this graph you can generate this sort of possible floor plans now some points i will say when an optimal configuration of these three models models have been determined they are merged together to get a larger model and this vertex when they are merged together this vertex a b c when they are merged together they are take considered as one super vertex okay i will come with examples okay the number of floor plans increases exponentially with the number of modules d considered at each level okay so d is thus limited to a small number value typically it is taken d is less than 6 okay suppose you take number of modules to be 2 then two possible floor plans are uh, can be done here this if you take d is equal to 3 then this sort of possible floor plans you can get okay so with the number of uh, modules d increasing you get an increase of uh, increase in floor plans exponentially now hierarchical approach has two uh, you know, we can uh, do this hierarchical approach in two ways one is the bottom up approach and the other is the top down approach in bottom up approach what you do is that you cluster up the smaller nodes into one bigger one okay and in top down approach what you do you go on partitioning the larger rectangles into smaller one okay now let us first discuss bottom up approach now this hierarchical approach works best in bottom up fashion okay the modules are represented as vertices of a graph while edges represent connectivity as i showed you earlier okay modules with high connectivity are clustered together okay but there is one restriction you in one cluster the number of modules should be less than equal to d okay this should be the restriction and it is obvious you can understand okay an optimal flow plan you can determine by exhaustive uh, enumeration and this uh, cluster is merged into a large module for high level processing next i will come now a greedy approach for this bottom up fashion now it is suggested that you first sort the edges uh, in decreasing weights now what you do the heaviest edge is chosen and the two modules of the edge are clustered in a greedy fashion okay suppose a and b are connected with a weight of the edge as 10 and c and d and c and d are connected with an edge weight of 5 then what you are going to do you will cluster ab first since their edge weight is higher okay then you are going to cluster cd okay but there is also one restriction that number of modules in this cluster should be less than equal to d it is obvious okay in the next higher level vertices in a cluster are merged and edge weights are summed up accordingly okay there is one problem i will come next now let us go with this example see a b c d e these are connected and the edge weights are given here okay a and b are connected with an edge weight of 10 c and d are connected with an edge weight of 10 and others 3 2 and 1 okay now what is said in this approach when a and b are connected with an edge weight of 10 you have to cluster this to first 
3 3 3 this e 2 and 1 see here it is given that the heaviest age is chosen and the two modules of the age are clustered in a greedy fashion so what you are going to do you will cluster a and b together and also c and d together because their age weights are 10 okay what you will do next in the next higher level vertices in a cluster are merged and age weights are summed up accordingly so you, you can find these three ages are summed up so each this age weight will be 9 okay and this is connected to e block whose age weight will be 3 okay so the possible floor plan approach is this a b clustered first then c d clustered next and then comes the e part okay this is the total floor, floor plan but there is one problem here okay, what it states that some lightweight ages may be chosen at higher levels in the hierarchy resulting in adjacency of two clusters of highly incompatible area you can see in this diagram this e is the lightweight edges okay now when they are placed here you can find this space is empty so the area becomes large you can optimize this area further okay so what you are this going to do there is a possible solution arbitrarily assign a small cluster to a neighboring cluster when their sizes will be too small for processing at a higher level of the hierarchy okay now so what you are going to do first now first cluster d and e first you are suggest to cluster d and e first then cluster d and e with c to get this sort of flow plan you can find here that the area is much more optimized in this section okay than this one this is a greedy clustering approach and this a better solution for this one is this one next comes the cost estimation of cost of this flow plan okay the cost of a floor plan is usually estimated from the connections the interconnections the net lens etc and the area of the floor plan area is one of the major parameter here you have to optimize the area in every cases what you do the area can be easily estimated because you are going from a bottom of fashion you are clustering two smaller groups together so you know the areas of two and the, so you can when you are merging you know the uh, area of the merged block okay the area of a particular choice can thus be computed for each candidate floor plan the each smaller blocks you can easily calculate the area now the cost can be estimated by summing up the age weights see this 3 3 3 9 you can sum up the age weights this cost sum of the age weights multiplied by the distance between the centers of two blocks this block is a and b distance between them say l when this cost c is thus defined by the summing up of the age weights multiplied by the distance between the centers of the clusters okay now the hierarchical approach top down fashion as i said you earlier that for the top down fashion uh, we go on partitioning different uh, ways the rectangular block is partitioned so each partition is assigned to a child floor plan two blocks are obtained when you are dividing first you get two blocks that is two child you are getting this partitioning is recursively applied to this child floor plans now major issue here is how we will optim obtain a balance graph i think in the uh, previous class partitioning uh, cunning link partitioning method has been taught to you that gives a balance graph of partitioning okay but this method is not very much widely used 
because of the difficulty of obtaining balanced partition. Okay. But one can do one thing that he can use both the top down and the bottom up approaches together. How? He can bottom up take he can use the bottom up technique to cluster some of the smaller blocks and then can apply the partitioning technique, the top down technique to this clusters again. Okay. But in general, the bottom up technique is used much. Next comes the pin assignment. The floor plan is done. Now the pin assignment. You have to assign the exact location of the pins for the flexible blocks. Because for the uh, fixed blocks, the pin locations are defined. Now, what is pin assignment problem? What is the purpose of doing this? The purpose is to define the signal that each pin will receive. Each, will, each pin of the block will receive a definite signal. So, you have to define the low position of each pins in the block such that the proper signals they receive. Okay? Now, this pin assignment can be done during floor planning, during placement or after placement also. Okay. Now, for undesigned blocks, a good assignment of pins improves placement. If the pins are properly placed on the block, then placement problem is much improved. If, even in case of routing also, which you will learn later, routing also, if the pin locations are such that the routing problem becomes easier. Okay. If the blocks are already designed, still some pins can be exchanged. Okay. To make pro proper routing for proper placement of this block. Now, what is the input to this pin assignment problem? A placement of blocks, number of pins on each blocks. If it is possible, then the ordering of this pins, pin locations is specified and the net list. What is the requirement? To determine the pin location on the blocks. And what is the objective? You have to minimize the net length here. Pin assignment should be such that the interconnection between two pins on two different blocks should be minimum. Okay. Now, what is functionally equivalent pins and equipotential pins? You can see here an AND gate is given A and B as two inputs, C and D and output. This A and B are functionally equivalent pins. If you interchange, swap the position of A and B, the output is not uh, hampered, not hampered, you will get the same output again. Okay. And what is equipotential pin? This C and D are equipotential pin, both are internally connected and represent the same net. No problem. Here the purpose is to optimize the assignment of nets within a functionally equivalent or equipotential pin groups. You can swap the uh, pin positions of e uh, functionally equivalent pins or you can swap the position of functionally equ uh, equipotential pins. Okay? You, uh, what, you do this because the objective is to reduce congestion or reduce the number of crossover. In this diagram, you can see that there is one crossover. But if you place the blocks in this way, there is no crossover. Okay? If you change the pin positions here, there is no crossover. So, you have to find out the exact pin locations. Now, the classification of algorithms. Okay. There are a number of pin location, uh, pin assignment algorithms. One is the, in among the general techniques, it comes concentric circle mapping, topological method, nine zone method. This nine zone method is basically upon the Cartesian coordinate. Okay. And there are other some special techniques like channel pin assignment. Now, the concentric circle mapping. Okay. The pin locations are given here. A, B, this sort of pin locations is given. Now, what you do? This sort of pin location is given to you. What you do? You draw a smaller circle 
and one bigger circle. Next, in the concentric mapping algorithm, what it does, the these pins are connected to the center of the circle. Okay, it is connected to the center of the circle. Next, it is rotated. It is rotated such that these pins comes and lie on this circle. This pin comes and lie on this circle. See, in this case, if you rotate this, this pins will come and lie on this circle. Okay. When you get an optimized position of this pin, what you will find? After uh, continuous rotating of this circle, what you will find? You are going to find that the pins has attained this sort of position. Okay. Finally, the pin position you will find this one. This is one method, concentric circle approach. This A, B, C and this is the fourth step you are rotating, not the D1, F1. This is the fourth step you are rotating. Then the after rotating, this pin comes in a much better position. They are much more oriented nicely and this is the best way, best pin location. Then comes the channel pin assignment. A significant portion of the chip area is used for channel routing. You will learn in the next class what is channel routing, what is uh, global routing, etc., etc. You will learn. Okay. After the placement phase, the position of the terminals on the boundaries of a block are not fixed. This position are not yet fixed. Okay. They may be moved before routing begins. You have placed this this thing. Now routing is not yet started. So what you can do? You can shift this block. Shift this edge such that the pin, pins are located much more nicely here. This will help during the routing phase. You will get an advantage of this sort of location of pins during the routing phase. Okay. This sort of algorithm is known as the channel pin assignment. Now comes the placement. Okay. Now, what is the placement problem? The input to the placement problem is a set of modules. Here, the modules are all well defined. They have fixed shapes. Okay. So, their pin positions are also fixed. You know the fixed locations of the pins on those blocks. And other thing is that a netlist. Okay. How these blocks are connected. Now, what are the requirements? Find locations for each module so that no two modules overlap as you saw in the floor planning problem. And the placement is routable. What it means? Suppose you have placed three blocks A, B and C. You have placed three blocks. Now, this, these are the empty spaces. Okay, these are the empty spaces. You sh you have to place these three blocks in such a way that you can connect all the pins of A with the pins of C or with the pins of B as you require. This space should be enough to connect those pins. That is routing. You can complete the routing problem. Okay, this spaces should be enough for completing the routing problem. See, if you place a block here and a block here and a block here, you may not connect this block with this one properly. May, suppose this space is very negligible, you will have not, you won't have some enough space to connect this pin with this one. Okay, so the space, the placement should be such that the routing is complete. Okay, what are the objectives? You have to minimize the layout area. Reduce the length of the critical nets and here the another objective is completion of routing. Okay. Now the placement problems at different levels. First comes the system level placement. 
what is system level placement this is the final chip okay you you need to place all the pcbs okay circuit boards together such that the area occupied is minimum and heat dissipation is within limits okay next comes the board level placement what is it the all the chips all the small chips you need to place them on the pcb okay the objective is the minimize the number of routing layers and meet system performance you have another thing you must take care that you have to meet the system specification in the system specification you have to meet this you you need to do all this thing in such a way that the final system specification is achieved okay then comes the chief level placement normally floor planning placement are carried out along with pin assignment here here when you will uh, learn routing there you will find there are number of routing layers okay there limited number of routing layers such uh, you should not place the chips uh, the blocks in such a way that this uh, total placement is unroutable okay and this can you can only find this problem while doing the routing part okay not in the placement while doing the placement problem you won't find there is any problem in routing okay this you will only uh, understand while doing the routing part and the delays you have to also minimize the delays okay at minimization of area is obvious now the problem formulation now b1 b2 bn are the module blocks wi and hi are the width and height of each block bi n is a uh, set of nets that is the netlets connection of diff with different blocks q is the rectangular empty space for routing and li is the estimated length of the net ni so what is it suppose b1 b2 and b3 these are the blocks w1 h1 these are the width and height okay n is the nets n1 n2 these are the nets q is the rectangular empty space these spaces suppose this part is the q q1 in this way all the spaces you can slice it into some smaller rectangles and li is the estimated length of net and i okay now the problem you have to find rectangular regions r for each of the blocks such that block bi can be placed in region ri you have to determine a rectangle r such r1 such that the block b1 is can be placed there suppose you have assigned a rectangular block r dashed here but the block b1 is larger than this one you cannot place it okay so the block bi can be placed in the region ri this is one criteria the next is no two rectangles should overlap okay this should not overlap this is a major criteria placement is routable what is that this q should be sufficient to route all the nets okay now the total area total area comprises of the area of the rectangle blocks and also the area of the spaces okay this total area should be minimized okay and another thing the net length i have denoted l as the net length okay the summation of this net length should be minimized okay and the next criteria is for high performance circuit max of li is minimized the maximum li it should be minimized okay now comes the interconnection topologies okay the actual wiring is not known during the placement problem so for making an estimate a placement algorithm needs to model the topology of the interconnection nets an interconnection graph structure is used vertices are terminals 
as discussed and edges are interconnections as said earlier okay now how will i estimate the wire length the speed and quality of estimation has great effect on the performance of this placement algorithms okay for two terminal nets the calculation of wire length is very easy you can use the manhattan distance method okay what is that if the end coordinates are x1 y1 and x2 y2 then the wire length l is mod of x1 minus x2 plus mod of y1 minus y2 but what we will do for the multi terminal nets how we will estimate this for that you have four methods complete graph minimum spanning tree method rectangular steiner tree and semi perimeter this is given here suppose you are given four pin location for complete graph what you do you connect all this all the edges okay this is complete graph for minimum spanning tree what you do you just connect the terminals okay this is spanning tree spanning tree method next comes the steiner tree what you do connect this one then move to this okay this is steiner tree next the easiest one is the semi perimeter method what you do you enclose this with a rectangle okay this is the easiest method now how we will cal calculate the uh, net lengths okay for complete graph n c2 n into n minus 1 by 2 edges for a n pin net okay for an n pin net you will get this number of edges but for tree you will have n minus 1 edges see you can find here for the nets for minimum span in tree there are n minus 1 that is 3 but here you will find n into n minus 1 that is it comes out to be 6 i think 1 2 3 4 5 6 6 okay and length is estimated as 2 by n times the sum of the edge widths okay the edge widths are given sum them up 2 into n by 2 by n times of it is the net uh, uh, multi term this net length okay for complete graph for minimum spanning tree this is most commonly used okay this uh, you can easily calculate the um, net lengths here the edge widths you can sum them up and calculate the net lengths for rectangular steiner tree this is the shortest road for completing the set of pins a wire can branch from any point along its net okay problem of finding steiner tree is very np complete okay now semi perimeter efficient and most widely used find the smallest bounding rectangle that encloses all the pins of the net to be connected estimated wire length is half the perimeter of this rectangle okay here it always underestimates the wire length for congested nets now comes the placement algorithm now it can be classified into simulation based partition based and other class other part Sim under simulation based simulated annealing simulated evolution force directed partitioning brewer's algorithm terminal propagation and in other section cluster growth force directed this sort of algorithms are there okay i am only going to explain the brewer's algorithm what it does partitioning technique is used to generate the placement problem okay the given uh, circuit is repeatedly partitioned into two circuits at each level of partitioning the available layout area is partitioned into horizontal and vertical subsections alternately as i have discussed earlier each of the sub circuit is assigned to a subsection okay now this process is continued till 
each sub circuit consists of a single gate and has a unique place on the layout area. So, I can say that this is almost an extension of, of min cut algorithm. Okay. Now, there are different sequences of cut lines used here cut oriented min cut placement, quadrature placement, bisection placement, slice bisection placement. How these are done here? See. Suppose you are given a rectangular block here and given with this w1, this w1 is the given parameter. For cut oriented min cut uh, placement, you first slice this one with a vertical line, this one is done. Then you see here it is given that the uh, available layout area is partitioned into horizontal and vertical subsections alternately. Now, once you have completed the vertical cut, now you go for the horizontal cut, this 2. Then once this is complete, then you again go for W1, 3. But for horizontal cut, once you have cut the upper section, then you have to go from the below, the bottom section. The fourth cut is the from the bottom, okay. This is the cut oriented method. Now, for the quadrature, it is from the name you can understand, you are going to uh, cut this into four parts. See, 1A and 1B. After cutting this, you are going to get these four parts. 1, okay. Then again, you are slicing with 2A, 2B. Alternately, you are slicing with vertical lines and horizontal lines. Again, you are getting four parts. This cutting algor algorithm method is called the quadrature part. Now, bisection, it is also clear from the name. You are bisecting the total rectangle. See, first you are doing with 1, then 2A, 2B, 3, 4A, 4B. Okay. And the slice bisection is the easiest one. Slice the total rectangle 1, 2, 3, 4, then 5, 6A, 6B. Okay. Slice by section is you are slicing the rectangle first. So, first cut this rectangular block in horizontal ways, then you are cutting it with the vertical ways. Okay. This is the slice by section method. There are other uh, algorithms also like terminal propagation, etc., which I am not discussing here. Okay. Anything further? 